thank you. God is good all the time. Hallelujah! God is good. And he's good all the time. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Truly we thank and praise God for another opportunity to come into his presence that he may speak to our hearts and our minds. We thank God for the incorruptible seed of the word that shall be sown in the fertile soil of our hearts. We praise God for each and every one of you that's on the prayer line. And we thank God for those of you who are coming in. They're um, coming in on YouTube. Amen. We thank God for you. We want to uh, acknowledge uh, Harriet Kelly. God bless you. Deacon Ann, God bless you. Michael Diggs, God bless you. Good to have you with us. Uh, Angie Swan, God bless you. Deacon Philip, God bless you. Elder Angie, God bless you as well. Sister Heidi, God bless you. Good to have you with us as well. We thank God for each and every one of you, and we praise the Lord for the victory that is ours. And most of all, we thank God for those of you who are in the house. Amen. Thank God for each one of you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. We are walking through the book of Acts, and we are in Acts chapter 12, around verse number 18. That's Acts chapter 12, around verse number 18. But before we get into the word, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your love, your kindness, and for your mercy. We, we bless your name, O oh God, for you are good. You are great and greatly to be praised. We thank you for the joy of the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is the strength of your people. And it is with joy that we draw water from the wells of salvation. We thank you for peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. We thank you for wisdom and knowledge, uh, knowledge and understanding, the ability to make the right choices and decisions and to carry it out with excellence. Father, we bless you and praise you for what you have in store for us today. We give you glory, honor, and praise for the word of God. Holy Spirit, take us on a journey. Uncover the mystery, the knowledge of the word. Expose it to our view. Give it to us with such practical application that we can apply it to our lives, going from glory to glory and from grace to grace. For your word tells us, that it does not yet appear what we shall be, but this one thing we do know is that we shall be like you, for we shall see you as you are. Thank you in advance of what you're going to do by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Well, we're in the, in the book of Acts, chapter number 12. We've just come out of the uh, 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 earlier part of uh, the 12th chapter of Acts where uh, Herod had taken Peter and had imprisoned uh, Peter. And his desire was uh, to kill Peter as he had killed uh, James, uh, the brother of uh, um, John, the brother of James. James, the brother of John. Um, and he had Peter arrested because of a couple of the Jewish feast days, a couple of the Jewish holidays, uh, what we would call holidays, but they were holy convocations. These were times that they were instructed by God to honor and to celebrate. They were a type and shadow of things to come. And so they uh, put Peter in prison because of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and because Passover was following the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he knew that even though the Jews were satisfied with, the, uh, uh, the, with them taking uh, James, that he could not 
um, take the life of Peter on their feast days. And so he's waiting until after that. But we remember that an angel of the Lord visited Peter while he was in prison. And the angel took him out of the prison, out of the gate of the city, and allowed him to go uh, to the home of Mary. And there he began to share with them the testimony of how he got out of prison. And so we get to verse number 18. Now, as soon as it was day, because Peter left prison at night, so he walked out during the night, and as soon as it was day, there was no, there was no small stir. In other words, it's saying uh, uh, it created a lot of havoc. Uh, there, there was a lot going on because Peter was not found there being shackled to those two guards, all right, to those two soldiers. There was a small stir among the soldiers. What was become of Peter? So they're trying to figure out what happened to Peter. Where did Peter disappear to? Where did he go? And, and you have to understand the soldiers are still sitting there with the shackles on their wrists because you had one on one side of Peter shackled and another on the other side of Peter shackled and they're shackled there to Peter, all right? But there's a problem and the problem is Herod wants to know what has become of Peter, where did he go? Who let him out? When Herod had sought for him, because again, remember, he was waiting. And so he sent for him, and he sent for him. And when he did this, they couldn't find him. So what he did was he cross-examined the keepers, those who were uh, guarding him. Because remember, the scripture says there were four sets of, of gods that were guarding him. There were two that were shackled to him. Then when you go to a certain distance, you got a gate. There were two standing there. And then at another position, there were two more. And then there were two more. So when, when he uh, was allowed to get out of there, he literally walked past uh, um, almost, um, what was it, 12, it, it was uh, um, four sets, so it was at least eight to ten soldiers, all right, now, again, let me go back and check this, because I don't want to give out the wrong information. But anyway, we'll correct my mistake later. <laughs> but anyway, he, he passes by all of these soldiers, and nobody knows what happened to him. Now, you have to understand that basically what would happen is when a person was imprisoned and they were chained to uh, uh, the guards that were watching them, if that prisoner escaped, then normally what would happen is the, the, the guards that were assigned to him now has to do his time. They now has to do, have to do his time. Now, we have to understand Peter hadn't been given any time. Not yet. Because the Herod's uh, desire wasn't to imprison him for any length of time, Herod's desire was to kill him. That's what he wanted. Now, um, remember, if you remember the crucifixion of Jesus, the Bible speaks of the accusation board that was above his head. 
And uh, on that board where Herod says uh, uh, that he was the king of the Jews. And uh, the high priest says, don't say that he's the king of the Jews. Say that he say that he is the king of the Jews. In other words, say this is what he's trying to say. That's the, that's the accusation. And Herod says, I have written what I've written. In other words, I've written that he's the king of the Jews. And that's, that's, the, that's what he's being judged for. So they would give them an accusation board. And, and that would determine, with that would determine uh, how much time they would do. And then um, they would be in prison. But if they managed to escape from prison, usually if it was before their time was up, usually the soldiers who were responsible for guarding them would then have to deal with that time. We see that with, remember when uh, uh, Paul and Silas, was locked in jail, and uh, they were at midnight. They began to worship, and as they began to worship, the shackles fell off of them, and and the gates uh, of the of the jail began to open. And uh, as this occurred, what happened was the gods were getting ready to kill themselves, and they were getting ready to kill themselves. And so Paul says to them, "Hey, hey, don't kill yourselves. We are all here." We are all here because he understood that if they, they, any of the prisoners had escaped, then those gods would have been responsible for them. And so that's what we're finding out here uh, with Herod and with the gods of the soldiers that were supposed to be watching Peter. It says, now Herod had sought for him and uh, found him not. He examined the keeper keepers and the commanders that they should be put to death and commanded that they should be put to death. So he now calls those who were responsible for keeping him. And now what he decides to do is those who are responsible for keeping him, he says, since, I, uh, since you let him go, since you don't know what happened to him, Somebody got to know how he got out of these chains. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you what I was going to give them, give him. And so what he does is he commands them to be put to death. And after he puts them to death, he says, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. So he goes there. To stay there. And as Herod is there, he is highly displeased with them. So he's there at Caesarea. He's displeased. He's displeased with the soldiers, his soldiers, his gods in the prison. And he's displeased with some of those who are at Caesarea. And he's also displeased because of what was going on in uh, Tyre and Sidon. All right? And now uh, they are. Um, they were preparing themselves because they were, they were upset at what was going on with Herod, but they, re they wanted to fight. They wanted to, to create a revolt, but they realized that they needed him for food. All right? It says, but then they came, uh, they came with one accord to him and having uh, made... Um, I can't remember pronounce this name right now. The king's chamber, uh, uh, chamberman. So they go to the guy who is responsible to the king. Who uh, uh, what would happen is uh, the king would have certain people that he would assign for certain assignments, and everybody didn't just come into the presence of the king. No matter what your problem was, you didn't just bring it to the king. You brought it to his counselors first. And then if it was uh, a worth carrying beyond that, then it would be carried to the, they would carry it to the king. And then if the king decided, then what he would do is he would uh, extend his scepter for you to be able to come 
into his presence. They desired peace because of their because their country. So again, they're desiring peace because they were in turmoil in their country. So they were preparing for war. And the reason they're, they're, they're desiring peace is because they know that they need what Herod the king has. Um, one of the things that we don't fully understand because we haven't had to uh, deal with uh, kingdom principles and kingdom authority. So some things that occur with the king and with his kingdom, we don't um, deal with those kind of things because we come from a democratic society. So we basically vote on everything, okay? But when you're under a monarchy and you have a king, the king is literally responsible for the people. So he, he, he's responsible for the people, and a part of that responsibility is making sure that they have food to eat. Making sure they have what they need. And you've probably seen on a few of the movies where you, they would go places and you'd see the king's uh, 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 convoy, and they would be throwing out bread and stuff like that to the peasants along the way. Uh, but the king was responsible for making sure that they eat. That is why, that is why Jesus tells us, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added to you. He's saying, I'm responsible for those things. He says, he says don't worry about what you're going to eat where you're going to sleep or what you're going to put on. Don't worry about those things. He said those things the heathens worry about. He says, don't you know that your heavenly father knows that you have need of these things? He's saying as a king over a kingdom, it's not your responsibility to worry about those things. He says, those are the things that I am responsible for. So he tells you to seek the kingdom, and as you're seeking the kingdom, then all of those things are going to be added because that's the king's responsibility. Are you following me? So that's their, that was their reason for ceasing the war and, and desiring peace because they realized that they needed the king for nourishment for their country. All right? Now, uh, King Herod, in verse 21, had, uh, and a, okay. King Herod is sitting upon the, the royal throne. He comes out on his throne. And he, when he comes out on his throne, he's dressed in his royal attire. All right? So he's dressed in his royal attire. And being dressed in his royal attire, one of the things that happened is um, the, uh, the sun is shining upon what he has on. And because it's royal, it's, it's also uh, glistening in the sun. And he comes out and he makes a speech uh, to the people. And they are looking at him and they are listening to him and uh, they, they are declaring that he he looks, well, not that he looks, just look like, that he is a God. They're claiming that he's God. All right? So they shouted, this is not the voice of a man. This is the voice of a God. Now, one of the things about kings is Kings always thought of themselves as being deity anyway. Yeah. 
They always thought of themselves as being higher than the other folk because they felt like God had selected them and they were gods. That's, that's the way they uh, uh, presented themselves as if they were gods. So the people began to shout. Now, uh, this is not the voice of a man, but of God. This is the voice of God. And so when they shouted this, what happened is, immediately, because Herod did not correct them, Herod didn't stop them, God intervened. Herod did not give praise to God, and an angel of the Lord comes by, and he strikes Herod down. And when he strikes him down, Immediately, the worms begin to eat his flesh, and he dies. The worms begin to eat his flesh, and he dies. Now, one of the things we could see here is that God is a jealous God. And even though he tells us to imitate him, we still cannot declare ourselves to be God. Even though he chooses to share his power, the Holy Spirit's ability with us, we still cannot claim to be God. Even though we may be operating in authority, we still cannot exalt ourselves to the position in thinking that we are gods. Why? Because God is a jealous God. And we saw that with we saw that with Lucifer. Lucifer's decision was I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will go high up in the north. And I'll be like the most high God. So Lucifer tried to exalt himself to be God. But not only did he do that, but the Bible speaks of how he caused a third of the angels to commit an act of treason with him. So he then began to uh, poison, poison their minds to make them think that it was possible for him a created being to overthrow the one who created him. And here's the same kind of scenario here with Herod. They are shouting, this is the voice of a God. But now you have to understand there were some other problems going on with Herod. What was the problems? The problem was he was killing God's people. He was trying to stop the move of God. He had again, remember in Antioch, after Saul was converted, persecution stopped. And the church began to grow and increase. Now they are back to the persecution. Because Herod is responsible for it. So when he kills James, He's, he's like, hey, you know, um, they, are, they are excited about this. They, they, it's, they are okay with it. So now let me get Peter. So what he's trying to do is put a stop to what God is doing. So he's dressed up in his royal apparel. He's, he's decked out. He's looking good. And he comes out there and they're looking at him and it's like the amazement as to how he looked. But then when he began to speak, instead of them acknowledging him as their king, they go beyond that and say that he has the voice of a God. And because of that, God releases an angel. Now, notice what it says. It said God released what? An angel. An angel. Now, 
God could have done it himself, but God won't step low to anything like that. It's, it's, that's beyond God. I mean, look, at, look, let's go back to Lucifer for a moment. Lucifer was a created being, correct? He was, he was not and is not on the level of God. Even now that he's Satan, he's still not on the level as God. Even though he says, I'm going to exalt myself high up in the north, I'm going to be like the most high God. He is not like God. He's not everywhere present at the same time. He's not omnipresent. He's not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He don't know about you until you open your mouth and say some stuff. Until you say it, he don't know that about you. Some things he might plant in your mind and make you think you thought of it, but he doesn't know everything about you until you open your mouth and begin to say some things. All right? So he's not all-knowing. He's not everywhere present at the same time. He's not all powerful. He has power, but he's not all powerful. His power is limited because he is a created being. The difference in him now and the way he was then was he was an anointed cherub. He was anointed to lead God's people in, uh, uh, to lead the angels in the worship of God. Now he is defiled. He's a defiled creature. God didn't fight against him in heaven. God didn't fight against Lucifer in heaven. What did he do? He called on Michael, the archangel, and a warring, warring angel, the angel of war. And Michael fought against Lucifer and cast him out. And so God is not going to fight what he created. Because what he created is always below him. And so what does he do? He releases an angel. Um, in our Wednesday Bible class, we've been uh, walking through the book of Revelation. And uh, we've noticed that even what is identified as the wrath of God, the wrath of God is carried out by angels. So it's not as if God is sitting there angry, mad, say, I'm going to get him. But no, what God has done is he has spoken some things concerning, uh, for instance, God has already declared that the wage of, of sin, the pay allocated to sin is death. So that means he has already put the word out. That means that his word uh, is going to be fulfilled. He doesn't have to sit there and look and watch and say, oh, you sinned. I'm going to smack you upside your head or I'm going to kill you because you are now in sin. No, he has already declared that you, if you choose to live in sin, the pay allocated to sin. He said, I'm going to give you a paycheck. And the paycheck is for what you're doing. But there are angels assigned to carry out the will of God. And so when, when Herod did not correct the people, because he didn't correct the people, that meant that he was taking the glory from God. That meant that he was allowing them to acknowledge him as being a God. 
And God says, no. And because of what you've been doing, I believe that, it, that that was only part of it. But part of it, I believe, was because that what he was doing was he was killing the saints of God. See, it mentions Peter, him trying to, uh, preparing to kill Peter, and it mentions him killing John, or James, but I'm sure that he probably had others that he had administered that justice or that judgment on. That's why the Bible says that he was persecuting not just those two, but the saints. And we've got to understand that that as God's as God's children, that he's not going to allow people to treat you and uh, and mistreat you handling you any kind of way. And that's why he tells us the battle is not yours. That's why he tells us that when they come against you, that it's not just against you, they are fighting against him. And it's impossible for them to win fighting against him because our hands, our arms are too short to box with God. So Herod drops dead, worms eating his flesh. Verse 22 says, but the word of God. Verse 24. Verse 24 says, But the word of God continued to spread. It grew and it multiplied. So even though they are trying to stop it, it continued. They continued to do what God wanted done. They continued to preach the gospel. They continued to spread the good news. And so when we understand that, when we look at that, we know that Basically, what has happened is God is going to continue, the kingdom is going to continue to grow even when we go through persecution. And we've been blessed. As a nation, we've been blessed because we haven't had to experience what other nations have had to experience because they have chose to make Jesus Lord of their life. Yeah. We haven't had to live underground. Even though our church is on the lower level, we are not an underground church. Amen. There are those who have to live as an underground church there, and they move the church from place to place to, to prevent them from being persecuted to prevent them from being beheaded and killed. And even though we have the liberty and the freedom to spread the gospel, some of us are still so selfish that we, we won't even unpart our lips and share it with others. So verse 22, 24 says, the word of God continued to spread and to flourish. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Verse 
they returned from Jerusalem. In other words, Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas was on what was their, what was a missionary journey. They had, they, they had been sent to carry out an assignment and after they had completed their assignment, they, re, they would return. And when they, they were fulfilled, when they had fulfilled their mission, they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So now what they've done is they've gotten an, 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 another person to go with them as they're going out. Now it's interesting because when Jesus began to send the disciples out, when he told them to go out and, and began to minister, when he said first sent them out, he said, don't carry your purse, don't carry an extra cloak, uh, don't carry anything extra, but he sent them out by twos. And the reason is because you are protected when you're going out to minister because you have one person who can minister the word while the other one is praying in the spirit or praying uh, uh, as a means of protection. And so uh, uh, what has been going on is the church is growing, but persecution has began all over again. And now uh, Barnabas, if you remember, when Saul was converted, most of the disciples uh, wouldn't accept him as a part of their family because they didn't quite believe that he had really been converted. And, and so Barnabas understood what had happened to Paul, and he knew from Paul's first uh, uh, initial sermon that Paul had been changed, that he was transformed, and so he chose to go uh, uh, to take Paul along with him to bring Paul together and for them to minister together. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> for them to minister together. And so, so they make a decision after they have finished this, this, what we call a missionary's journey. <clears throat> they make a decision to take someone else with them and they're taking uh, John, whose surname is Mark, and, and they're taking him, and understand, they're taking him because of the ability that he has. In other words, they know what his skill set is, and they're taking him because of his skill set. And sometimes we don't understand that there are those who are in positions of leadership who are, are given insight into skill sets in the people that are, they are responsible for. And when, when those things are made, when they are made aware of certain things, you may be called to carry out a certain assignment because you may not feel that you're capable of it, but it means that the skill set has already been seen in you. And what God is striving to do is to bring out of you what is in you so that you can carry out the assignment of God with excellence. Now, there were, there were in the church in Antioch, A certain prophet and a teacher. I'm gonna stop right there and look at this. I want I want us to look at this because what they're saying is that when they went they they went back to Antioch when they they got to Antioch in the church there were prophets. And there were teachers, prophets and teachers. They both were there 
they had different assignments. Mm -hmm. They had what? Different assignments. different assignments. There is a different grace. There is a different grace that is given to all five of the ascension gifts. There's a different grace that is given to all five of the ascension gifts. What are the ascension gifts? It says when Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. He gave first apostles, secondarily prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Each gift, each one of those gifts have a different metron of grace, a different level of grace, because they have a different assignment. Now, however, there are some who are, I could say, cross-trained. And what I mean cross-trained is they may have a dormant gift, and then they have another gift that flows along with that gift. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that's because God chooses to use them uh, in order for the release of that grace. All right? Now, let me bring out a little clearer. You hear me say often that what kind of ministry is this? It's non-denominational, but it's in... Apostolic and prophetic ministry. That means that the chief grace upon this ministry is apostolic and prophetic. And so that means that there is a release of that grace. The, what is the grace? Grace is unmerited favor. But it is also God's divine enablement. It's the, <clears throat> it's the ability of God in you to carry out a certain assignment. Now, when the Bible says that Christ ascended on high and he gave gifts to men, these gifts given to the church are for the edifying of the body. Shall we all come into the fullness of the knowledge of God? So what he's doing is he's giving the, the, the uh, gift, and through that gift, there's a release of the grace of that gift, and that grace is to be released into the entire body. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody in that church becomes an apostle. It doesn't mean that everybody in that church becomes a prophet. What it does mean is that released in the life of the people is a part of that apostolic grace, which means that they are going to follow um, structure and order. Also, it means that they are going to walk in an anointing. It doesn't mean that they are necessarily a prophet, but they may have the gift of prophecy. It means that they can prophesy. Now, Paul said, says it this way. He says uh, uh, that, uh, that everybody should be able to prophesy. Why did Paul say that? Because you have to understand what prophesying is. What is it? It is exaltation. It is edification. And it is comfort. So what is he saying? He's saying everybody ought to be able to edify somebody else. You ought to be able to tell somebody else that you can make it. You ought to be able to lift up somebody else. Encourage somebody else. And that's what he's saying when he says all of us should be able to prophesy. 
But all of us, it doesn't make all of us prophets. Because the mantle of the prophet is a different thing. Now, here is what we have to understand. And I don't know how I got in this vein. Here's what we have to understand. We have to understand that if there is a different metron of grace, if there's a different anointing to each of those offices, and you're not called to that office, it means you don't have the grace that it takes to stay there. And when you put yourself there, then what you've done is you've opened yourself up to the attack of the enemy that you're not qualified to fight against. Are you following me? So the level of grace with the gift means that it's to be imparted to everybody. And that's why you keep hearing, that's why you keep hearing pastors say that the gifts of healing isn't just for fivefold ministry. That's why you hear me say the gifts of healing isn't just for the pastor. It isn't just for the elder, even though the scripture says you can call for the elders of the church and they shall lay hands on the sick and they recover. But it's not just for the pastor and the elders. The gifts of healing is for the body. It's for the body. The gifts are for the body. And so the release of the grace, the grace of the, the Bible says that 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 gift was given to the individual, then Paul asks a question. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all evangelists? No, he says, they're not, all of us are not. He says, but what happens is when that gift is released in the church, that grace and that anointing is being released, it gives you the ability to function in those areas. So you're given, so you in other words, the anointing on an evangelist. The anointing on an evangelist is for souls, right? All right. So now the anointing on an evangelist released to the body, the church at large, it means the church at large has now become a church that is after souls. They are looking to win souls for Christ. The anointing on the teacher. The anointing on the teacher is what? To teach. To dig deep into a subject. To digest it. To, uh, to pull it apart. To expose it in such a way that it brings enlightenment and understanding. So the grace of the teacher is being released. What happens is you, you are receiving an impartation. And from that impartation, it means that you now have the ability to go back and regurgitate what the teacher's teaching. Because you're now receiving an impartation of the what? Of the grace. Are you following me? See, so when we begin to understand... <laughs> I'm asking the Lord how I got here. I got here. Because we have, we are not on the, on the lesson. So what we're trying to, what he's sharing with us is that he is cultivating, developing, and training. And as he's cultivating, developing, and training, then what happens is he's preparing those who are moving to the next level. And it starts with the impartation of grace. And as the impartation of grace is, is, is there, 
you then begin to go through the metamorphosis, the change, the transformation, and then the elevation begins to come. You see, so he gives all, all five gifts to the church for the edifying of the body. And the reason they are all still there is it's because he says, till we all come into the fullness of the knowledge of Christ. We haven't got there yet. We've got to get to the place where uh, the Bible says the earth is moaning and groaning and waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God. And we've got to get to that place where we are sons, where we are walking in sonship. And walking in sonship, it doesn't mean that you got to be a male because it, the Bible speaking of sons is male and female. We are all sons of God. But walking in sonship is understanding uh, the authority of what you have as, as, as your inheritance. I'm, I'm a son of God. And that means as a son of God, I have inherited certain things from God. Mm -hmm. And I have a right to walk in those things. I have a right to function mm -hmm. in those things because that is what he has given me. When you look at what Jesus did, the Bible says uh, Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God. He, he, Jesus says, uh, uh, the works I do is what I see my father do. So he's saying, in other words, he's saying, I have the authority to do what God does. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that we are uh, made off of the same pattern means that we have the right to do what Jesus did. We have the authority to do what Jesus did. And then Jesus says, greater work shall you do because I've gone to the Father. So he's saying, I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you ability. I'm giving you grace to be able to do these things. You see? And so what happens is the grace is being released. And as the grace is being released, the anointing, that's, th that's what we call the anointing. Mm -hmm. The anointing comes, and we are able to walk in that anointing. Mm -hmm. We are able to walk in that anointing. And it becomes a progressive walk. I see you. It becomes a, what kind of walk? Progressive. progressive walk, yeah. a, a progressive walk, exactly. You're you're moving forward progressively, mm -hmm. and and as you're doing that, God is refining you. Yeah. He's training you. He's yeah. developing you. Mm -hmm. He's cultivating the gift in you, mm -hmm. and that's important because what happens <clears throat> is if if we move out of timing then uh, we end up being hurt. But we also can end up hurting mm -hmm. others. Yeah. Um, I guess I guess I have to start chapter 13 Sunday. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think I will. We'll start chapter 13 on Sunday. So, um, are there any questions? Somebody looking at Minister Al. That's good. We hear the first life ministry. We know when we walk in the in the full measure of progressive manner that we should, do we know it? Are we close to it? Say that again, please. We here at Victoria's Life Ministry, will we, will we know when we are walking with the all five essential gifts, walking uh, in the right direction? 
when, when we are, when all five ascension gifts are there, we are walking in the right direction. But I, let me let me share something with you. Um, and uh, th there's the analogy of uh, this water bottle. This water bottle is a 16 ounce bottle of water, right? Um, well, it's, it's a, I, I took a couple of swallows out of it, so it's not completely full. But just imagine that this is full to its capacity. All right? So um, what happens is this gets full to its capacity. And we are like, like that water bottle. We're full to capacity. When we get full to capacity, what happens is we sort of get satisfied with where we are and what's going on. And then what happens is God says, okay, uh, they are, they are, they've been obedient and I've blessed them and they are full to capacity, you know? And so what God does is he changes the container from 16 to 32 ounces. Now, the container is a 32-ounce container, but you still only have 16 ounces of water in it. So now you're only where? Half full. So now you're only half full. And, and, and now what must you do? You've got to go back to God and, and start all over having him pour into you so that you can do what? So that you can get 32 ounces. But then once you get 32 ounces, what's going to happen? He's going to enlarge your capacity. He's going to enlarge your capacity. So what happens is uh, God never wants us to just get satisfied where we are. And so what he does is he uh, enlarges our capacity once we get full. Once we get to a certain place, it seems like we at that place, and, uh, you know, it's almost like you're stuck there. You know, you, you feeling good because it's like, oh, man, you know, the presence of God, the power of God is moving here. Oh, good. And then all of a sudden you come in and, and it's almost, it seems like everything is just, say, what happened? What happened is the container has been enlarged. The capacity is now greater. And so now you have to have a greater hunger and thirst for those things. And that's why you hear me say to you often, when you come, come with expectation. We should never come in here without expecting God to do something supernatural, do something miraculous, to speak directly to us, to pour into us. Because as we do, our, 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 when our capacity is full, he's going to enlarge us. Because there's always more. There's always more. And then once you get the more, when you get to the point, when you get to the point where there's no more to be expanded, watch out. Because then, he, then, he, then he's going to take you out of here. I knew that, I knew that, I knew that, Bishop. I just wanted to mess with my class. Yeah, but that's also what I was sharing, sharing with you when I say this is an apostolic ministry because what he does is, is some of us, he fills us up. But then what he does is he allows you to take what you have and you take it somewhere else to pour it out. And then after you poured it out, you know, you, you're like, you know, I, I went out and I, I ministered. Oh, the anointing was so great. But you empty now. So what you got to do is you have to come back to be poured into again. And when he pours into you again, then you're released to go out again and pour it out. You see, because again, it's not just for you, for me. You know, we can't just be sponges. Sponges 
absorb and hold whatever they absorb. Not, not until you ring them out. We have to be a funnel. A funnel is allowing what God pours in from one end to come out the other. And that's what he's calling us to. See, because it, 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 the, 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 the hungrier you are, the more the anointing is being released, the greater the power of God that is flowing. After a while, what's going to happen is you, if you're just sitting here, you're going to be so fat that you can't move. <laughs> and then after you get that way, then you, it's like, you know, okay, uh, we're going to talk about such and such today. Oh, yeah, I know where you're going with that. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and it's almost like you, uh, okay, I'm going to run down the road and wait till they get to the, the exciting part, <laughs> you know. So, so it, we have to understand that that's not where we are and that's not where we're going. We're in a place where God is pouring into us. And, and, and again, because this ministry is being prepared to, to be an impact on our city, our state, and our region. And anytime the prophet came and said that, that, that there are uh, five cities within a, 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 a 50 mile radius, that means, you know, we think was well, cities, but what we're not thinking about is what we call cities are also called uh, are counties. They're called, they, they, that would be the same as a city, you know? And so, so when we start looking at it, that there are areas that God is saying, okay, I want you to have an impact in this area. And so we start with the, we start impacting through prayer. And as we're praying, then we move beyond prayer to the physical impact. And some of it, some of it will be because you're already in that region. Right. You're already in that area. You know, and, and God is just, just using you as, as a, a, a conduit. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, uh, you, you are uh, that conductor that, that, that current is coming through. That power of God comes to you. You can't just shut the circuit breaker down. You know, nobody else would have any electricity. You shut the breaker off. He's allowing you to be able to release it to those who are around you. Y'all, are you following what I'm saying to you? Okay. Any other questions? No other questions? What's your question, Sean? Sure, sure. Um, uh, um, sometimes, sometimes uh, pastors will release people to go to other churches to help them to get certain things started, to do certain things. Yeah. Then after they have built that area up, then they come back home. Uh, and again, that is a part of apostolic flow. Yeah. You know, um, and then sometimes it's, it's just for a, a particular assignment. Uh, um, to, to develop something. It may be uh, y your skill set in uh, helping to develop a department. You go there, you, you work to get that department, you get the people together, you get them up and running, you tr they're trained, and, and they can carry out the assignment. 
they don't need you any longer because they are already prepared for that assignment. Now you can go home, back home. See, so yes, there are times when those things will will and can happen. You're welcome. Any other questions on the prayer line? All right. All right, if there are no other questions, then we will, we will uh, come to a close. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to share with, among your people uh, this day. And we pray, Father, that the word, the seed that have been sown, Lord God, will be uh, cultivated in their hearts and in their minds to help to develop them to the full extent of what you're calling them to in this season of their life. In Jesus' name, uh, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord turn his face toward thee. The Lord be gracious unto thee and give thee peace. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, that all the saints of God say amen. 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 amen.